going to start the workshop by talking a bit about extended reality and about web browsing. And then I will do a, a small demo uh, where I will use Wolvic and I will also use the Wonderland engine to develop very quickly an immersive web application. So as a presentation, my name is Felipe. I'm a software engineer and interaction designer. I work on the Wolvic team at Igalia. And Igalia is a free software consultancy, and we are specialized in open source technologies on a wide set of platforms. Uh, we mainly work around the web platform, but we also do lots of other, of other things. As a quick summary of this talk, I'm going to be talking about the challenges and the opportunities of web browsing on extended reality or virtual reality. Drawing from our experience as the creators and maintainers of the Wobbic browser. Web browsing on extended reality enables users to navigate and to interact with traditional web pages and also with immersive extended reality experiences. So Related to that, Wolvic is, as I mentioned, an open source web browser for XR devices, which supports those immersive experiences. And the Wonderland engine is a platform, a development platform, an API, a development environment that facilitates the development of immersive applications for the web. So let's start talking about the traditional web, the web as we experience it in our desktop or in our phones nowadays. So when we think about that, we think in terms of windows, in terms of tabs, of moving back and forward in the navigation, and also additional functionality like bookmarks, keeping track of the history, keeping a list of downloads, managing passwords, playing media, uh, maybe even adding extensions, for example. And all of this needs to be translated to an extended reality context, because that's basically the experience of the web that users are familiar with, and they, they expect, and they, they find most useful. Um, some of this is done by the what we call the browser engine, uh, Gecko, Chrome. Basically, the piece of software that implements the standards and the APIs of the web platform. But some of this functionality needs to be also adapted specifically and implemented again for extended reality. So in this video, this is how Wolvic looks out of the box. So we have the skybox, we have an environment that you can modify. You can pick different ones. Uh, you have a main window, a static homepage with some experiences, and then we have a tray with some additional functionality. And the way that you interact with traditional content is through navigating, basically similar to what you would do in a desktop. So you use the input device, um, a device like this one, to click and to scroll through the, to the website. Um, some additional functionality can be, or has been already implemented, for example, the finding page functionality, so you can search for um, text in the, in the current page. This is something that, is the kind, as I mentioned, this is the kind of um, useful things that users expect from the web um, experience and that we also have to provide in extended reality. Uh, we also need to implement, for example, the prompts. This is the date picker, uh, which is a very small part of the web platform, but something that we need to uh, provide in a particular way for extended reality. In this case, is this dialogue that is actually floating in front of the user so they can pick a particular date. 
There's another example, the file upload that displays a list of the <coughs> file in the, in the user's device. And this is a final example of integration with uh, existing web APIs, which is the web app uh, API, the web app manifest that we use to create a list of favorite um, web apps or favorite websites. Uh, the web app manifest kind of gives a lot more information about a website, including uh, high definition icons and, and so on. And this is something that we need to also interact with as a, as a web browser. One big difference between the traditional web and extended uh, reality devices is the input. Typically, these devices are controlled by controllers, like this one, or through hand gestures, hand recognition, and other methods are also supported by, by some devices. But most of the traditional web is made for the desktop and for touch screens. So usually in Wolbeck we get around this by basically pretending to be a phone most of the time, and other times we pretend to be a desktop. Um, but there's some content that is designed specifically for a particular input method that doesn't play well in extended reality. Uh, for example, websites that use pinching and dragging, websites that use keyboard short shortcuts, etc. Those may not work just as well in extended reality, simply because the input method is, is so different. Um, one interesting thing about um, these devices is that the input methods are different, but they are also, they cover a wide range of, of possibilities. So I mentioned already hand gestures, controllers. Uh, we're also working to integrate external Bluetooth keyboards to integrate both voice input. So you have a different range of input methods that is very, on the one hand, it's very rich. On the other hand, may need some adaptation to be in some very particular cases in the relational web. This is the hand recognition that we have working at the, at the moment. The device, uh, the platform, provides us with the details of where the hands are in space, and then we apply our own mesh on top of them, and we do the gesture recognition. So it's actually a very complex um, feature to, to implement, and it's something that we, that we keep iterating, we keep uh, refining on each, on each version. Because it's also a very direct way of interacting with the content. Another um, challenge that we have with the traditional web is readability, is the ability to read documents, which is how the web traditionally started, no? as a way to share documents over the internet. And in external reality, the reading experience is limited by the resolution of the headset. And you have a trade-off there where you can use a large screen, but it cannot be too large, because otherwise it would cover the field of vision of the user, and it sort of be like a giant window floating in the sky. And, or you can make larger text, but if you make the text too large, then also the page will be somewhat harder to use, because maybe the layout is not exactly um, the more comfortable. No? This is basically a hardware limitation, a limitation in the resolution of the, of the devices. So it's something that has been getting better already as the hardware, as the hardware improves. But it is still something to, to take into account. Um, this is an example where first we pretend to be a browser, um, a smartphone, and then make the window bigger. But already this window is kind of 
it covers a large part of your of your visual visual angle. So it couldn't be much bigger than much bigger than this. Um, a very um, powerful opportunity for web browsing extended reality is that instead of being limited to just one screen in, screen in front of the user, you have a large virtual space that provides great flexibility and allows you to arrange content around the user, sort of make the most out of the user's spatial thinking, spatial memory. I, this is interesting, I put it here, and I'm sort of aware that it's here to my right, for example. So this kind, this kind of spatial reasoning of knowing where things are located around you is something that is very powerful, but it's also something that is hard to use in a limited sort of traditional device. And it's something where extended reality can have a very big opportunity. And I think that it has the potential to become a very productive, very flexible way to work. So this is an example of Wolvik with two windows where you have a painting on the left and you also have the YouTube channel of the museum on the right. So another example where you have Wikipedia, you can, be, you can be on Wikipedia, you can be on YouTube, you can be visiting the museum's website. Um, it's, it's all around you, it's, 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 it's immersive, it's a, it's a whole workspace around you for this content that you are focusing on. So, Currently in, in Wolbeck, we support up to three browser windows arranged around the user. And I hope this is not too confusing, but we are working to make this more flexible. So instead of having just three windows going from a situation where we have the possibility of having multiple windows around the user to fit part any particular use case. You go, you, and, and you're going to have uh, several windows, you could also have visible tabs, and we want to make this um, something that you can customize, so you can make the interface as simple or as complex as, as you need. Another big use case for the web in general, the traditional web, especially, is video and entertainment. Uh, video is usually provided as regular 2D video, but these devices can also do 3D so-called stereoscopic or side-by-side -side video that I will show in a, in a moment. So this is something also that the web browser in extended reality has to, has to support. Uh, the most popular um, platforms and also the online subscription services uh, like, I don't know, like Disney or Unext and, and, and so on. Um, one thing here where we need support from the browser engine is in, is in that some of these services do use a specific uh, DRM, a specific digital rights management technology. They have uh, encrypted their video feed in a particular way. So we need support from the browser engine to be able to, to decode it. But um, in Wolbeck, actually, we, we don't do quite a lot of work on, on this, and we try to support as many platforms as, as possible because it's a very um, interesting, very attractive use case for, for our users. And this product, for example, a documentary showing on, on Disney Plus. You notice also that the area around the around the screen has been dimmed and we have hidden the rest of the user interface so we can focus, so the user can focus on on the video being played. There's another another example from a movie, also from Disney Plus.
Um, we also need to integrate functionality that comes from different um, video services. For example, in this case, what this clip shows are YouTube captions as Michael Caine is talking there. The YouTube captions are transcribing what he is saying. So this is a support that we had to add additionally, that we had to implement in the, in the browser. And this is the side-by-side -side video that I mentioned before. Like if you remember watching Avatar and looks like the characters are coming out of the, of the screen, it is this, this technology. Basically, the, the video is split in a, for the left and the right eyes. And if you mix that geometry in the, in the right way, if you show part of the video to one eye and part of the video to the, to the other, then you get this 3D, this 3D effect. And the nice thing about this, as I mentioned down there, is that this is running on, on YouTube. This is running on an existing platform, existing video platform, um, that is able to support this, um, this kind of 3D video. I'll, I'll mention more about, about this in a moment. So now we, we get to the immersive way, web. The, web experiences that can only really be properly enjoyed with an extended reality device. Um, the first example, as I just mentioned, is, is video. Video can be actually served over the internet uh, just as a regular video media file uh, because it's a media file that has been created with a particular geometry. And the web browser, if the web browser is able to display it according to that geometry, then you get the effect that the video was trying to, to achieve. You get the effect where you have a video playing all around you. Uh, a very important um, component on this is metadata. Um, in order to display the video with the right geometry, you need the write metadata. And this is something that has been a challenge for us on some platforms, for example, in, in YouTube, because many of the videos don't have that metadata. So you kind of have to either you try to guess or you let the user pick the right one. But then it's an additional complication that you put, additional burden that you put on the, on the side of the user. I have some examples. This is um, a very nice functionality. It's kind of the first thing to show to people when you show them a, an Excel device. Is this immersive videos. Because really, this is the, the best way to experience this, this content. You don't get the same, it's the same experience when you are just watching this on a, on a TV. So a lot of these videos are made for sort of sightseeing. There are also some examples of more dramatic stories that can be created from the start as immersive videos. And then we move on to immersive experiences, to WebXR. And WebXR is a collection of web APIs that allow the development of immersive experiences on the web. And this is standard. Uh, it's all properly documented, it's supported by different uh, browsers, um, Wallpick is, is, is one of them. Um, this is mostly implemented on the side of the web engine, but the Immersive application still needs to make sure that everything is connected to the graphical layers, to the input, and so on. Um, WebXR has several advantages that make it very attractive. One of them is that it's cross-platform, that you can uh, target 
a wide range of devices with just one application instead of needing to create one application and distribute it maybe in different app stores for each device. Um, and because it's a standard, uh, you know that it will be supported in the, in the future and will be supported in future platforms and, and devices. Uh, it's very easy to, to distribute, uh, both to distribute the first standard, the user wants to use it, and also to deploy updates, because to deploy an update, you basically just need to update it in the server and then each user, when they visit the web page, they will get the updated version. And it's very easy for users to, to share with their friends because it's basically just a URL that they have to, that they have to share. So I have a few, uh, sorry. So the way WebEx, WebXR works is that the web browsers provide special features to the web applications. And the web applications uh, then through JavaScript can make use of these features. Uh, for, and for example, they can render 3D environments via WebGL or WebGPU. They can render audio through the web audio API. And then natively, internally, the web browsers implement those, those APIs. So Web, WebXR is um, a common way for web applications to, to use all this functionality. This is one example of a WebXR application where you can just pretend to be holding a, a graffiti can and do a graffiti on a on a wall. This is a more complex example where you pretend to be painting a, a painting. And, and you notice that the, the input in each case is, is different. Uh, each application shows you the tool that makes the, the most sense for or the use case, in this case is um, brushes for painting. And then finally, this one where you can do a light drawing in 3D space. So this is, so whereas this example uh, is something that you could, is something where you are pretending to simulate something in, in real life, you're pretending to simulate the user painting um, painting, then you get also applications where you are doing something that is not possible in real life. It's not possible to draw with light in a 3D environment around the user just like this. So there's a very interesting transition there, going from things that look real to things that could only exist in this medium of immersive reality. One big opportunity for this kind of uh, content is education. Um, it's a very big opportunity, I think, for both for immersive video and also for immersive interactive content because um, extended reality is the best way to experience immersive information and there's a lot of information that you only really get if you see it when you see it all around you, then it becomes much, much easier to, to understand. And far, furthermore, the web makes it very easy to distribute this content. And you can, you don't need to create a separate app. You can even use existing platforms. So it makes it much easier to distribute this educative content. This is an example from, from YouTube, an immersive video where you fly with a pilot all from takeoff to, to landing, and you can see how the pilot is using the different controls. You can look around the cabin to see how the different um, measures look like. And this example is uh, an evolution on it. It's a, uh, I would say it's an interactive video. It's a 3D video, but every once in a while, um, you're supposed to identify the problems that are happening in the cabin around you. And again, this is the kind of experience that you could only 
give people by, by immersing them, but by actually making them able to look around them and see the, the environment as it is in the in real life. This is a uh, way. Ah, yeah. Okay, so this is a um, website of a, of a museum where they have captured the whole museum as it is, as it looks in real life, and it lets you move to different spots in the museum and look at the, at the paintings. And this is a real museum, and this is another one where the paintings are real, but the museum has been constructed, designed for immersive reality, sort of a museum that doesn't exist in real life. And this lets you do very interesting things, like for example, it lets you step inside of the picture, um, see how the environment that the painter was, was uh, showing, what it would have looked like in real life at the time. So I think this, this is very powerful when it comes to, to communicating to, to people in general and to students in particular. Um, this is another example from NASA. Um, this is the Mars rover. Um, in this case, it's using actual topography and actual satellite images from Mars to kind of construct a real Mars around you. So you can have a, a, a sense of what it really looks like over there. And, and again, it's the, it's the, it's the kind of, of experience that you need to experience in, a, in an immersive context. You, you need to, so to, in order to understand it properly, you need to be able to, to look all around you and, and, and see that, that large space around you. And you wouldn't get that from just looking at a photo in your, in your computer. Um, Another very interesting um, use case is gaming. Gaming is already one of the most popular use cases for extended reality. And WebXR can be used to, to implement uh, games, and there's many, many examples already. There are some limitations in the sense that there, uh, there's limitations when it comes to delivering large assets um, because they are delivered on the spot over the over the internet, but on the other hand, on the other hand, the fact that this is delivered over the internet makes it possible to load things incrementally. You don't need to download the whole game in one go. You can download the first level and then you download the second level. Um, in some cases, the performance the performance may be lo lower than in native applications. But not all, actually. I, I was uh, talking with a developer a few days ago, and actually because they had been able to optimize their WebXR uh, platform so that it delivered bet actually better performance than a native application, which had not been optimized for a particular hardware. So. There's a lot of space there for performance, uh, performance gains. And as I mentioned, the, the fact that it's a standard, that it's easy for people to get started on developing, that it's easy for people to um, distribute, makes it um, very easy for there to sort of independent creators, developers, to just put their work in progress out there and get feedback. And, it makes for a very creative community. Um, this is a um, small example where you do a puzzle in space by manipulating 3D blocks. It's another one that simulates uh, climbing over a wall. And then this is one of the most popular ones in, uh, currently. It's, um, it's like the, the native, there's a native game where you use two lightsabers to 
you wave them around to the sound of, uh, of the music, and that has been implemented in WebXR as well, just as the, just like the native experience. And uh, it's actually really fun. <laughs> if you want to try it out, uh, just let me know, and we can try it later. You just need a bit of space so you don't start walking things. So, uh, now I'm going to talk a bit more about the Wolbic project, about the web browser for Exact Reality that we have been working on at Igalia. Wolbic actually started out as Firefox Reality, was released initially in 2018 with the goal of bringing Firefox to standalone VR headsets, supporting the traditional web and immersive experiences, and it was part of a wider mixed reality initiative at Mozilla at the time. The project was handed over to Igalia in 2022. We changed the name and we took over the development uh, since, since then. The main components of Wolvik are a custom 3D library, so we can position elements in, in 3D space. A web engine, which is the one that interprets the web content and renders the web page. Uh, most of the user interface is actually built with regular Android components, um, the buttons and text views and so on. Um, for the browser functionality, for bookmarks, history downloads, and so on, we use the Android components provided by the Mozilla Mobile project. Um, we also use OpenXR to access specific device capabilities, and in some cases, in some platforms, we also use some platform-specific libraries. Um, I've been talking about web engines and the and to give a bit more information about this, um, a web engine is basically the component, the library that interprets and renders the web content. It's the component that is able to take a, an HTML text file and know that this corresponds to a certain text with a certain size, a certain color, and so on and so forth. In Wolvik, um, we started out using the Gecko web engine, which is the same one used by Mozilla Firefox. We actually used the standalone Android library that the project provides, um, but one of our goals is to make it possible to change web engines, to not be tied to one specific implementation, but to be able to be more uh, flexible in that regard. So we are also working to integrate Chromium, which is the web engine used by Google Chrome. And we are currently under development, um, and this feature is currently under, under development. And our long-term goal, as I, as I mentioned, is to be, um, able to switch uh, web engines and to support more, even more alternatives uh, as a way to support different use cases and different, different devices. Wolbic is multi-platform. It runs in a number of, of different devices and, and platforms. And it's able to do that by using OpenXR as an um, abstraction layer to access most uh, extended reality functionality. OpenXR is an API that uh, allows XR applications to access functionality that is specific to XR in a way that, that is not tied to the particular platform and, and device. But even if we have this abstraction layer, we I still need to consider that the devices may have different capabilities. So we need to test specifically with each different device. We need to identify 
um, bugs that they might have or difference in behavior that they might have. Um, we need to work around their different device formats uh, because some of these devices are headsets that you wear in your head, and other, others are augmented reality glasses that let you see the, the world behind. Uh, others are glasses, but that are tied to a, or connected to a, to a regular phone. So there's a whole, um, it's a lot of variety in the devices that we, that we cover, and we need to test them all. Uh, even if we have um, functionality and libraries that make it easier for, for us as, as developers. Um, incidentally, this is a reason why Wolbeck is an immersive application. Wolbeck is not just a window that comes up in the virtual space, but it's an application that takes over the whole virtual space and builds a whole 3D world around the user. And one of the reasons for this is that simply that there isn't a unified way to create a desktop application in XR because some devices don't support this concept. And the ones who do support it, they have different ways of implementing it. So by being an immersive application, we are able to have bigger control over the, the whole user experience. Wolbeck is developed in the open, is um, published under an open license. Uh, it's funded through an open collective. We have a GitHub page where we have the code and we have issues and a wiki there with all sorts of development guides and tips. And in order to, to run it, in order to try it out, uh, the application is, is free to use. We are currently distributing it in three app stores, the Huawei, Meta, and Pico app stores. And we also provide uh, side packages for side, side loading that you can download and install in your application, in your device. So this is the website for um, where you can download the, the packages for, for Wolbeck. So you can just download it and install it in your VR device. This is the GitHub page where we have the issues and the pull requests and all of the work that we do developing Wolbeck is in the open. So you can see there uh, many of the issues that we identify, how we update things, how we um, discuss code changes, etc., etc. And we also have a wiki page there with uh, all sorts of guides for getting started running, compiling Wolbeck, running it, um, contributing to it, if you want. So if you do try Wolbeck, I do encourage you to to check this out, to go to the GitHub page, and if you see any issue, any, any problem, uh, just um, tell us about it in the, in the issues uh, tab there, so we, can, so we can fix it. And finally, this is the open uh, collective website, where through different um, partners and contributors, we, we found the, the project. And finally, I'm going to talk a bit about the Wonderland engine. Um, the Wonderland engine is a development platform for web-based uh, graphics applications for virtual reality and also for other, for other use cases. Um, Wonderland Engine comes with a 3D development environment that can be used to create and to deploy these applications. Um, it's implemented, in, the runtime is implemented in WebAssembly that runs in the browser. It has been um, very optimized, so it actually has pretty good uh, performance. 
Uh, the development um, platform in already includes components for multiple different functionalities that would be useful in creating these kind of applications. Uh, so it includes support for animations, for detecting collisions, um, for light, for input, etc., etc., etc. So as part of the workshop, I am going to be using this tool, the Wonderland Engine, to create an immersive application for the web, and I'm going to try it out in Wolpic. So let's see if that works out. Oops. Yeah. Okay. So let's change over here. Okay, so as I mentioned, the Wonderland engine Okay, here we go. Can you see that? Okay, so, so, um, so this is the website of the of the Wonderland engine, and here, in the getting started section, they have a number of tutorials to get you started developing immersive applications. So for the, for this workshop, I am basically going to be following just the quick start application, a quick start tutorial, and I'm going to be making some additional changes and sort of give you a, a taste of how uh, immersive applications can be, can be developed for the web. So, the first thing to do is, as it says here, install, install the Wonderland editor, which, which I've done beforehand. And now we can create a project. So we're going to we're going to create a project here. We are going to choose the VR template. I'm going to name the project as Go Sim Wonderland, and we're ready to go. Okay, I was not expecting that. It worked. This this usually works. Okay. 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 There we go. There we go. So let's let's create this. Let's create my cosim wonderland, and we create a VR project. Okay, so this is how the editor looks like, where you have um, the 3D scene over here in the center. You have the different elements in the scene here on the left. And then we have the different assets over here. And then we have the console over here with all kinds of different uh, messages. And then when you do select um, an element, you will get some properties. For example, here, this property, this element has a light component, so you can change the color of the light, intensity of the light, and so on. And the, com the components can also have interactive um, behavior. Um, so if you want to try it out, you can just, you just need to click this green button over here, and it will create a package, start a web server, and open the browser. And if I do that, it opens the browser with, oh, with the message, welcome to Wonderland. Okay, 
But this, okay, so we, ha so we have a 3D application. We don't have an immersive 3D application just yet. So what we need to do for that is to connect our virtual reality device to the computer. Yep. Okay, for, for this demo, I'm going to be using this, com I cannot really see it. Uh, SCR CPI is, is basically a command to copy the output of, um, of, an, Andro of an Android phone of a, or of an Android device. And if I do that just without, if I, if I do that, a ver, okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so if, oops, hell. okay, ah, there you go. Okay, so if I do that, then we see how the magic is made. Because this is actually what the, immersive VR application looks like. It's two different video images that are projected on each eye, and then through the lenses, it gives the illusion that there is a 3D environment. Uh, this is not very useful for, for I mean, this is, this is good to know. I mean, you, can, you have to know how, how, how it works under, under the hood. But for visualizing, for visualizing, I'm just going to, I'm just going to crop a little bit of that. Okay. So you can see just the image for one eye. So it looks more like a regular application. And in the 3D space, you can see You can, yeah, there it is. You can, you, can, you, can, you can see my hand in the 3D space, or if I pick up the controller, now you can see the controller. Okay, so we can go here to the install applications and pick Wolvik and launch Wolvik. And as I mentioned, this is the default, default um, layout for Wolvik with a browser window over here in the center, um, the window controls, uh, reload, back, forward, URL bar, um, different page actions, etc., etc. And here at the bottom are some common um, and some common functionality, access to your bookmark, and so on. And as you can see, there's a big VR button there in the center, and I'm going to click it. And when I click it, we have entered the virtual 3D space. So this image is no longer just on the screen of my laptop, but it's actually all around me. So now we have a way of visualizing the immersive experience on the web using a VR device. And with this, we can start doing changes and iterating on our little application. Okay, 
minutes. Ah, here we are. Okay. So, as I said, following the tutorial, choose the VR template. We have the 3D environment that we already saw. We were able to make it run in the browser. We were also able to make it run in the development in the VR headset. And now let's start doing some changes. We are going to start by deleting some of these. We're going to delete the cube, cone, sphere, delete the panel, and there's a little change here in the floor pane. The floor pane actually if you look at it, it has two components. It has a mesh, which is what you see in the 3D space, and it has a collision component, which is used for, for navigating, for detecting that, they, that it's something that the user can, can bump against. So of this, we are going to just delete the mesh and keep the collision component. And now, we are going to add an asset. The assets are regular 3D files, regular 3D environments. This is an example. This is the example that is used in the tutorial. And we can get this example from the web um, put it right into our immersive application. This is another environment. This is the one that I'm going to use, this little farm. So we can just download it and put it inside our application. The way to do this is to just I'm following the tutorial, basically. But it's just to create an Assets folder here. And inside the Assets folder, I am going to copy this file, the low-poly low poly farm 3D asset. Right? And now, Following the tutorial, we need to add the this file is needs, needs to be dragged into the scene view. The GLTF file is what will get loaded in our 3D world. So we can do just that. And if we do that then something has happened. We have all the environments. Okay. Yeah, okay, there we are. Okay. We have loaded that 3D asset, that 3D scene in our web application. Now I am just going to move a bit the, the lights just so this scene can be, can be seen better. I'm also going to update the light components a little bit. Um, you can change the type of light over here. You can say, no, oh, that's too much. Like this, and like, and we change this other one. This is a a very oops, still too much. This is a very nice. Um, 
situation to be when you are, when you are creating um, this kind of very visual content, because basically you are at the point where you can just iterate and try out different things. Okay. And the last thing that I need that I need to change is the position of the of the player, the position of the of the user. The user is represented by this little component over here. And if we open the component, we see that it has a whole bunch of different things. It has a an element for the controllers for the hands, for the eyes, for the position of the head, etc. So just to so let's have a look, let's check how this let's check how this looks. And to make the lights to look Okay, let's try that. So here we can just click the green button and it will open in the, the browser as before. So it's, this can be a very quick way of checking how things look like, right? So here we have the 3D environment and we can look around and check where we are. Maybe we want to position the user. This is the player. Want to position the user a bit farther along. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's put the user here next to the gate. And then we click the green button and we can check how, how this looks. And we see a cow over here and another cow over there and that's the farm. Okay, it looks, seems to be okay. Let's try it out in VR. So again, I put on, put on the headset and just reload the website and that's it. That's the, the new version that we just that we just made. And if I open the the VR experience, now I can see how things look like. I can see that I have the trees over there and I have the animals. Okay, so this is looking okay. Let's see if we can add something more interesting to this scene. So let's add a, char a character, let's add a cowboy. I think a cowboy would, would look well in this team. So we can go here to the sketch fab and we can look for an asset that looks right. We can find this one, this character I think looks pretty fun. So we can, so we can integrate him in the scene just like I did before. Cover Assets folder over here. I have the low poly cowboy file that I just dropped. These are the basically the steps in, in the tutorial. It's just um, I'm just using them with different assets, and then we can just click the GLTF file and drag it on the scene. And there we go. Let me go. Ah, there you are. There you are. Okay. Ah, but we have a we have a problem here because it's actually a tiny Oh boy. Look. 
Okay, so we can we can make him a bit bigger. We just have to sit and make him a bit a bit bigger. We can select the scaling, the scale him by by two along each dimension. There you are. Okay, this 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 looks much better. It looks more like a proper cowboy. So as I mentioned, the player, it's right around here. So you can click again, you can rotate a bit the cowboy. So he's facing the player. And let's see how it looks like on the browser. So here we are on the browser and we look around and then we see a cowboy is next to us. And then, finally, if you look around, then you realize that the sky is all gray. And what is happening here is that we need a third kind of 3D asset that paints the sky. Uh, this is what it's called. Uh, Skybox, and uh, Skybox is also something that can be you can look for, and and you can and you can find in Sketchpad, for example. So I got this one, and I'm going to repeat the exact same procedure. This is the. Sky, Skybox, Anime, Sky. I will add it to the Assets folder. Then I will select the GLTF scene, and I will drag it over here. That's it. This is the Sky. Some of these files have different scales because they have not all been developed together. So usually when you get files from different contexts you have to yeah you have to adjust the the sizes just so they will be uh, play well together. Um there's a lot there's a lot more um tweaking that we could be doing here. Um, we can be playing with the lights, for example. We can be, we could be add, trying to add shadows. We could add um, controllers. We, we could add behavior. We can add interactive elements, et cetera, et cetera. Let's check our scene now in the browser, see if we are in the right path. And it looks like we like we are. There we are. Ay, the shadows are very harsh. How do I make the shadows? So here we are, and it's sun. And Okay, so we got the farm, we got the sky skybox, we have the cowboy, and we got them all together. And now the, the problems now are basically the same problems as anybody doing um, a 3D application has to face, has to make sure that things look good together, make sure that things are well integrated, and make sure that you know, make sure that you make a, a fun game with, with these tools. But I think what I like about, about this is how easy it is to, to iterate, how easy it is to go from changes here to changes that you can see in the browser. And 
not just in the browser, because now I am going to once again get my headset. As I, as I was saying, this is a very easy way to get started um, creating immersive applications. Um, it's actually very fun. There are, as I mentioned, there are lots of different free 3D assets that can be used as a, as a starting point to, to create little games. And the fact that this runs on the browser makes it very easy to, to deploy and to, and to distribute. So and this is also what gives the, um, makes for a, for a very rich, very creative um, scene of, of independent um, developers making games. The technical details are actually not that complicated. Basically, almost everything works out of the box. And we are at Wolvik, we are working with the people at Wonderland Engine to make sure that it becomes just something that you can just click and and run. Um, there's, at the moment, there's basically just two adjustments that need to be done. The, the first one is, can you see this? Okay, oh yeah, for, for developing. So the, the first adjustment is this ADV reverse um, command. What this means is that when uh, it basically forwards a port from the device to my computer, when an application tries to access port 8080 in this device, it will actually be accessing port 8080 on the computer, which is the port where the web browser for the Wonderland application lives. And then the other adjustment is that there's a setting in, in Wolbeck. That allows you to do remote debugging. So, sorry. So here in the, in the developer options, there's an option to enable remote debugging that allows you to establish a connection with the browser so you can do um, for development purposes. And this is actually very powerful because it's not just useful for this use case of developing immersive applications, but it's useful in in general. If I open here Firefox, I can go to remote debugging. Rex the devices, I can connect. And then okay. Yeah. So I can I can connect to the Quest 2, which is this device. And in the Quest 2, there's uh, a web browser running. And I can get all sorts of debugging information from it through this uh, Firefox API. Information about the open tabs, information about extensions, and, and, and so on. So, so this, these two adjustments that I mentioned, the ADV reverse and the remote debugging are basically everything that is needed to be able to very easily run immersive applications in Wolvik. And to get this very agile development experience where you can change things, you can move things around and very quickly you can see how they look like in the immersive, uh, in the immersive world.
So this is basically what I just mentioned about the, the demo details, the SCR CPI to be able to copy the screen, and then using Wolbeck, Wonderland Engine, ADB Reverse, so to be able to access the web server in the laptop from the VR device, enable remote debugging, and then you can just build the web application Wonderland Engine and access it in Wolbeck through the local host 8080 page URL. And this gives you, as I mentioned, uh, a very interesting, very quick uh, development experience. So as a sort of um, conclusion to the, to the talk, I wanted to, to communicate, to transmit that the web browsing or extended reality has a uh, great potential for a large number of use cases going from education and productivity to entertainment and gaming. And the web, by its nature, lowers the cost of experimenting and distributing, so it tends to create, foster this uh, creative community in the immersive web, just as it did in the traditional web. So um, trying things out on the web can be a way for more innovation and for more creativity in the extended reality field. Uh, there are still open questions regarding the UI design, regarding input, regarding interoperability, different devices, and so on. But we are working on it, and as bit by bit, those questions are are getting answered and, and resolved. And with this, uh, this is the end of the of the talk. Thank you, thank you very much for for attending. Hope it was interesting. I don't know if uh, anybody has any questions. Um, we have a few devices for you to yes. Uh, hi, Helpy. I'm from Huawei, and uh, uh, and I have one question about the interaction. Uh, how do you think about the in the future uh, the most powerful interaction in your mind? Uh, right now, may, uh, right now we we can use the controller, and uh, right now you can use our hand. And uh, in the future, maybe you can use our eyes or other other types of like like the watch or our rings. So, how do you think about it? Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a good question. And one thing about this new ways of interaction is that you actually have to. Try them out because because it's a, it's an, an embodied experience. It's, it's something that you do with with your body. You cannot really be explained. No, you need you need to build build a environment where you can try things out and iterate very quickly. So you can try a lot of different solutions and then just try to pick up that little experience that lets you say that oh there's there's something interesting. If I combined these two elements, then there might be something interesting there. And, and for, the, for that, you need to be able to, to iterate quickly and to need to be able to, to prototype, to try things out uh, quickly. And I think in, in, that, in that respect, I think the web is a very interesting medium for that because it makes it easy to, to prototype and to distribute and to let other people try try things out. So I'm sure even even now thinking about um, different solutions that might come in the in the future, I think the, the solutions that we can think about now b before trying them out are going to be a lot simpler than what people are going to come up with after they can 
play with the actual thing and see how it see how it feels and see what is comfortable for them to for them to do. So 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 I think so, so rather than focusing on, on a specific technology, I think my message is more about the need for um, for quick prototyping and for for just trying 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 things and let people um, experiment. I have support for pass through. I can I can try it out if you want. If you want to see yourselves, give me a second. This. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> there you are. Yeah, so this is this is something. This is one of these things that depends a lot on the on the device. So, for example, in the in the Quest Two, as you can see, the pass through is still uh, black and white and very low resolution. But on on newer devices, it has much much better resolution. And it has full color. So this is one of those things that need to be tested to to see how how they work on different different devices but yeah this is this is something that in the few in the in the future I think is going to be very very powerful especially as the devices are able to not just have a video but also have like a 3d map of what the space around you looks like can you also show when you're adding windows with the ah, yes yes uh, Okay. Yep. Ah, okay. Yes. So we have this button over here. Plus creates clears a window. And as I mentioned, we We support up to three windows at the moment. And then you can also resize them if you need a window with a different window with a different size, for example. So there's there's some flexibility and it's something where we are working to, to add to add more flexibility kind of to adjust to the different things that that people want to do. Another question, I think you also support environments. User can create new environments or yes. ship a few examples, maybe have you changed? Well, it? I mean, we, we support different environments and we are working on a way so this is, for example, another one that we that we that we support that we are shipping currently, and we are working on a way to be able to serve these environments um, on demand. So you would see a, a list of possible environments, uh, several of them that you can select and download on the spot and, and use as your as the environment around you. So that's something that we are is very advanced. Is uh, if it's not in this in this coming version, it's, go, it's going to be in the next already. And this is something that is going to make it easier for people to adapt Wolvic to to their needs and to the way that they that they want to work. Okay, I have a question about the, the AR. Do you any, have any planning on, on AR that can be working on the mobile device? Uh, oh, 
augmented reality. AR, AR, not a, ah, not a, not a VR. A, 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 AR. AR. Do you have any plan or roadmap on about that? A, yes, yes. Um, yes, we plan on, on, on supporting AR. Uh, one way of supporting it is, as I showed in the in the pass through, from the point of view of the, of the application, mm -hmm. um, but the pass through and the AR are kind of similar to to implement. Yeah. Um, because basically you, there's an area of the screen where you paint the windows and there's an area where you let the cameras or you let the, the outer world um, come in. Um, we are also working on adding support for the AR APIs on, on WebXR, although I don't know what the state of that is uh, at, the, at, at the moment. But, but yes, it's, it's something that we, that we want to that we want to to, de to develop in the in the near future. We want to support in the near future. Also, be also because there are some really nice um, demos, for for example, that make use of, of AR already on the on the web, and we want to want to support them. Okay, I'm, you know, you know. Furthermore, um, besides you know showing the video of the uh, the reality in the uh, in the headset. Are there any you know, you maybe algorithm that can be recognized the real world the, the, the object in the real world? Um, we are limited by what the platform provides us. And I don't know if, if there's a APIs, WebXR or OpenXR to give us that information about the, the external world. I think that's basically the, the limitation because we, we do try to use as much as possible the existing uh, standard libraries also because it's a, a way for us to allow us to, to support different, uh, different devices. I will have to check it out. Thank you. Uh, I am a 3D app developer based on 3GS, uh, and uh, 3GS also has um, uh, VR features. Uh, I want to know if I, if I don't need a, a game game engine editor, I only use code. Uh, is is the um, Wonderland engine uh, um, ideal platform to develop with? 3D uh, uh, VR development. Um, I th I think so. I mean, uh, a nice thing that about about um, the Wonderland engine is that they have a lot of information already available, a lot of documentation, and it's free to use. So, and as as I as I showed, is is easy to easy to get it started. So. So I think uh, I think the best the best way for would be for you to, to try it out. They have a, a showcase section here in the web page. Uh, yeah, like that. A showcase section where you can see a bunch of different uh, real world um, games and and projects. So I think this can be a good way of of giving you a taste, uh, understanding what what it. Uh, what it's capable of. And here they also have some examples uh, where they show a specific functionality that they are able to implement uh, using the, the Wonderland engine. So I think as a, as a developer, I think uh, the best advice that I can give is just to really try it, try it out. I think, I think it's very powerful from my point of view. So try it out and see if, if it is what you, what you need. So, so it's a, a comparable uh, platform to a lot like other web uh, uh, web game engines like uh, Bubble and JS, 
um, play canvas and fetch that. Or 3JS, uh, I'm a developer based on 3JS. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure because I haven't worked that much with um, with those frameworks. So I, I don't know how it compares with with others. I do know from what I've been um, testing with it that it has very good performance and it's easy to to get started with. Um, it has been very optimized for the VR use case. So um, one of the developers was telling me the other day that they were able to get better performance on WebXR than the native Unity application because they were optimized far more than what Unity was, was doing. So I think for, for this use case, um, it, it could be the, the right tool, but uh, really my, my advice would be to, to get started, try it out, and see if it, is, if, it's, if it is what you need. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have any other questions? For Felipe. Maybe we could uh, also just look at the start page. There are a lot of examples of WebXR uh, yeah. experiences. And I think they're built on different development platforms. Some are using 3JS, some are using Babylon JS, some are using Wonderland Engine. So it's kind of a mix, uh, A-frame. Another very popular for developers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is the the start page for for Wovic. There are all the experiences that we sort of recommend and that we suggest to people as a good starting point. There's a toggle here where you can select some that are more specific for for China, um, like including specific streaming services. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything in particular that you wanted to try out. Ball shooter, I think that works well in, uh, like if you have a connection that's not too fast. Under experiences, Matt, Matt's is saying it's under experiences. Okay. Yes, okay, there we go. Okay, yeah, so there's a 3 3G is, um the experience is this room full of balls and you just throw balls around. You have this physics of the balls bouncing around. And this is also a, this is also a demonstration of the good performance of the, of the platform that is able to handle the collisions with all these balls. really good performance. And as I mentioned, this is an example in, in 3JS. Uh, another one that I mentioned earlier is is Moon Rider, although this one might take a little bit more to load. Oh, there we are. Okay. 
Yeah, Moon, Moon Rider is developed using A-Frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's there's different kinds of... Um, you can open the A-Frame. Loads. Okay. Yeah, so A-Frame is, is another um, example of um, a development platform that can be used and it creates VR environments. So there's different to different ones to to try out. There's different possibilities, and they try to make it easier for for people to get started. And I think that's one of the more interesting possibilities of the web. In, in that I can try out all these different experiences very quickly, just browsing through through them. I'm not sure if one ride is going to load. So, Philippe, Philippe, I can also mention that there are a lot of uh, multiplayer, uh, quite a lot of multiplayer games as well, built on WebXR. Uh, so one game is called Robot Rally, uh, which I think you should try out. Also, in, in, in overseas markets, there are quite a lot of metaverse experiences uh, where you can... Um, I think you can be at least up to 50 people in the same same world. And the, the cool thing with WebXR is that you can have some people joining in VR, you can have another person joining on the phone, you can have another one on the desktop, everyone in the same space at the same time. So that's unique with WebXR in, in relation to uh, native uh, applications. Yeah, yeah, and, and some of the... Exam some of the examples from from Wonderland also yeah I have an exa I have an example here when sorry. sorry. I got, I got an example, I'm not sure where they put it. But yeah, uh, basically, yeah, there's uh, also a lot of work being done on, on virtual worlds, on um, permanent virtual worlds that people can can join, and they can join from the browser, and they can join through different, through different devices. So I, I think that's also something where the web makes it easier to have this sort of permanent multi-device experience that can be very attractive for, for users. It can be a different kind of experience that is hard to, to do otherwise, especially if you take into account that it has to be multi-device, the users can have to be joining in from different places and with different capabilities. So maybe you should summarize as well with saying that Wolvik is the only hardware agnostic browser available in the market. So there is the uh, Quest browser on Quest devices, but it's only for Quests. You have the uh, Pico browser as well on the Pico devices, but Wolvik is the only WebXR browser that works on basically every VR headset. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that, that's a good point, thank you. Yeah, that's and, and, and that's and that's true. We are um, the only web browser for VR that is multi-platform, works on all sorts of different platforms, and it's also open source. So that gives us a very unique position as the browser where you can that, that can support all sorts of immersive experiences in many different. VR devices. So I think an important message to all developers is that they should 
do a lot of QA work and, and test using Wobbic if they want to make sure that their experience works on uh, Pico, on Quest, on Huawei, on, on all the devices, they should use the Wolvik browser to test and then they will make sure it works on all devices. Yes, that's a, that's, that's, that's a good message that uh, by targeting Wolvik, um, you can make sure that your application works on on many different, many different devices. And, and we are actually working with um, framework creators, for example, um, the Wonderland editor here, there's an option where you can tell it that it can launch on, on Wolvik. It can, it can connect to an external VR device and launch Wolvik there to try your application. So that's something that we are working with them to streamline it, uh, streamline it as much as possible to make sure that it's just clicking a button and then you are able to try the application. An advantage that Wolbit has over other browsers is that we can make this work across many different devices. So whichever device you have, you plug it in, you install Wolbit on it, and then you can have your development environment working right out of the box. So that's something that we think is very interesting and something that we are working on. And you can, as a developer, you can contribute directly as well, right? Yes, yes. Uh, as I as I mentioned, we we have uh, GitHub and we have different uh, channels also in in social media where you can get in touch with us and contribute issues or contribute code. Um, one thing that is very valuable for us actually is knowing about use cases, knowing about, knowing about what the people are trying to do with Wolvik and with their VR devices and ways in which it might not be working for them. I think that's also, also very, very useful for us because, um, I mean, we try to, to, to test everything that we are aware of, but there are some use cases that we might not be aware. So, so I think that that's something very, very valuable for, for us and something where we are always willing to, to learn and to, and to cover use cases that are important for people.